to sing another hymn, uh, hymn number two on our hymn sheet. It says this, It pleased the Lord to bruise his only son on Calvary, that he might ransom sinners such as you and set you free. He hid his face from Jesus, whom he loved so tenderly, with all his heart and yearnings deep and true on Calvary. Although the piercing cry went up on high, from Calvary, my God, why hast thou forsaken me on Calvary? The heavens returned, nor echo groan nor sigh on that dark day, and all that he might freely pardon me on Calvary. It's a remarkable verse, that first verse, to think that it pleased God to bruise his only son. And we read in the Bible that it pleases the Lord that through the foolishness of preaching he saves them that believe so we'll just take the first verse of hymn number two uh, and please the Lord to bruise his only son
again. We'd like to thank everyone who's, who's come along. And we trust that you'll be blessed by God for coming. Um, again, we'd like to express our gratitude to the Campbell family for the use of the site. We really are indebted to them. And to the Hanna family for the use of the trailer. Again, we, we're very thankful for their kindness and goodness to us that we're able to have these meetings here. Now, just before we pray, as is our custom, we'll read out some names that uh, are in need of prayer, and we trust that the believers would uh, remember them. Uh, there's many more that are not on this list, some by choice, some because we don't know of, but uh, it's always good to pray for people. I believe in the God of prayer. So you'll remember these names. Clyde McCullough, Will Barber, Jim McHugh, his daughter Linda Sharp, Rhoda Newell, Jim Hamilton, Mildred Bingham, Kenny Mart. The speaker today is my brother Michael Werner. Next Lord's Day will be David McBride. Now, we'll just bow together for a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we bow humbly in thy holy presence again, and we do so through the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're thankful again, our Father, for the privilege that is ours just to come, to, come before thee in all our need. We wonder at it sometimes how that we here poor mortals upon earth, sinners of Adam's ruined race, poor sinners of the Gentiles, yet our Father through the work and worth of thy well beloved Son, we have an access to the very courtroom of heaven, to the throne room, and we can make our requests not known unto thee, the great God, the all-sufficient one, the great God of eternity. We come to pray for those that are not so well. Think of these names that are being mentioned, others maybe that haven't been mentioned, some that are going through operations very soon. We pray for each and every one, and we look to thee for their blessing. But we pray also, our Father, for the purpose for which we have gathered, for the preaching of the gospel. We thank the Our Father that is still going forth. It still is the day of grace. Thou art still calling out from among the nations a people from the, for thy name. And even today, Our Father, some could be brought into the family of God simply by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, putting their faith and trust in him, knowing their sins were given and they could go on their way rejoicing. We pray for the gospel wherever it goes forth around this area and throughout this favoured land of ours. We look to thee for thy blessing and for salvation. We pray for our speaker, that thou will give him the help that's necessary. And our Father, we pray for the hearer alike, that we will be blessed even by listening to the message of the gospel. We're thankful again for thy goodness and kindness to us, and we ask all these things, offering thanks in the precious and worthy name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, just before our brother Michael comes up, we'll sing a verse of hymn three. Now, it's really hymn two continued. Same tune, same hymn, but we'll sing verse four this time. The cross unfolds the wondrous love divine on Calvary and shows in woe love's majesty supreme on Calvary. Then ye to him that weren't hurt a part of thine at Calvary and then cross the cross will be thy theme throughout eternity. It says at the bottom of the hymn sheet, eternity where? That's something to consider. But it might be well even just to consider the blessing of salvation here and now. It will be a blessing to you if you got to know the Saviour. We'll sing him four and then the meeting will be handed over to our brother Michael. The cross on
It's lovely to see you this afternoon, and as Adam has said, we make you very welcome. And please do start your car, turn your heater on, and no way will it impact on me. This afternoon I would like to take you to the Acts of the Apostles for a reading, please. Normally I just read one verse this afternoon, just a few verses to explain what we are trying to uh, get at this afternoon. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 3. It says in verse number 1, Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. The story continues that this man was healed of his infirmity. And in verse number 8 it says, And he leaping up stood and walked, and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. We see that Peter then commences an address to the people, and in verse number 14 he says, But ye denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you, and killed the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised, from the dead, whereof we are witnesses, speaking of the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you go down to verse number 19, you read there, Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. The people that heard this message from Peter were not pleased. It says in verse number 3 of chapter 4, And they laid hands on them, and put them in hold unto the next day, for it was now even tide. Verse number 7, And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have ye done this? Verse 8, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, And we can see Peter's Address. In verse number 10 we read these words, Be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. Verse number 12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name, under heaven, given among men, whereby we must be saved. This will be my text for this meeting this afternoon. Verse number 12, and what a verse it is. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven, given among men, whereby we must be saved. That will be our reading with, from God's word, with God's blessing upon it. Last Sunday afternoon, if you were here in the car park at Riverside, or perhaps you listened to the meeting later online, you will have recalled that uh, Jonathan Laird was our speaker last week, and as part of his message, he brought to us the story of the Philippian jailer. And there comes a part in that story, and Jonathan brought it to us last Sunday afternoon, there comes a part in that story when, following an earthquake, the jailer came and he sprang out and he came before Paul and Silas and he asked a tremendous question. He asked this, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And the answer that he was given then was exactly the same answer as Jonathan gave you last Sunday afternoon. For he said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. So the question, what must I do to be saved? As I thought of this meeting this afternoon, I thought of another question and I would like to leave it with you. And I would like you yourself to answer it before you would leave here this afternoon. And that question is along similar lines and this is what it is. It's simply this, dear friend, are you saved? Are you saved? Maybe I could phrase it another way, have you 
been born again. Now, not now the person in the car beside you, or not perhaps the person listening to this in their home later on this evening sitting beside you. I address this question to you, an individual. Have you been born again? Or could I even go further? Dear friend, are you on the way to heaven? Now, I would like you to, to pay particular attention to how I asked that question. I didn't say, are you on your way to heaven? I asked, are you on the way to heaven? You know, folks, this afternoon, society at large has many misconceptions as to how a person will get to heaven. I would like, with God's help, to look at some of those this afternoon and look at our Bible, this book which I have in my hand, this book which is God's Word, and see how it tells us to be sure of a place in heaven. Just at the very outset, I would like to say this, and I want to be very clear. People, heaven is not the default place you go when you die. Heaven is not the default place you go. Rather, if you were to look at the chart behind me, and some week we'll maybe print this off in the will of God and, and give it to you, Sad to say, friend, if you die as you are born, then eternity will be spent in hell and the lake of fire. This book, God's book, is very clear in telling us that. So, what are some misconceptions in society at present? Just recently I had a conversation with a friend, a colleague. It wasn't a very detailed spiritual conversation, but it was a conversation regarding spiritual matters. And at its end, he said something to me, and it really shook me. This is what he said. He said, we believe different things, but we're all Christians and we're on our way to heaven. We believe different things. We're all Christians. We're all on our way to heaven. Perhaps there are some here this afternoon, perhaps there are some listening to this online, and maybe you think that we are all Christians. Maybe you would even think that we're all on our way to heaven. Well, if we just turn to our Bible and see how it deals with that question or that suggestion, if we were to turn to the book of Psalms, we would read these words. Psalm 51, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Dear friend, we are not all Christians. We are not all on our way to heaven. Indeed, each one of us here this afternoon, each one of us has been born into this world as a sinner. A sinner by nature and also a sinner by practice. Misconception number one, it's wrong. We're not all on our way to heaven. Perhaps you say to me, well, okay, I give you that, but... There are certainly many people worse, or worse than me. I can tell you of someone I go to school with and, well, they do things that I wouldn't do. Maybe you could tell me of someone you work with and they take shortcuts that you wouldn't take. Maybe you even watch the news, you listen to the radio, you think of famous people and you think of them and you say, well, those people do things which I wouldn't do. I'm better than them. Again, if we look at this book and we see are there degrees of badness or there degrees of goodness, 
my Bible, your Bible, God's book would answer that question. There in Romans chapter 3, and this is what it says, For there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Dear friend, there's no difference. We're all the same. All have sinned. Perhaps there's someone here this afternoon and you say to me, Okay, I know I have been born a sinner. I know that there's no difference. I know that we're all the same. But what about my good works? What about the good that I do in society? What about the kindness I show to my neighbours? What about the volunteering I do in the community? Surely God, surely God will look down and he will look at my good deeds and he will weigh them up against my bad deeds. And if my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds, then I will occupy a place in heaven. Dear friend, again, if we turn to this book, what does it say? Ephesians, and in chapter 2 this time, it says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Dear friend here this afternoon, dear friend listening to me on the computer, there's absolutely nothing that we can do to save ourselves. We need to leave this, I need to move on. One other misconception, I just throw it out now. I trust there's no one here this afternoon and they said to me, well, Michael, I come from a Christian family. My dad, my mom, my relatives are saved. They pray for me. Surely that will ensure I be in heaven. Dear friend, it's a real blessing to have saved parents or to have those who have an interest in you, to have those who pray for you, but they cannot save you. There's not a pastor there's not a preacher, there's not a priest, there's not a person on earth who can save you. Indeed, if we were to turn to our Bible again, to Psalm number 49, we read these words. None of them can by any means redeem his brother. That's just four misconceptions. There are many, many more, but I want to leave it there. Friend, could I, could I put it like this just as I move on? There in the Proverbs, in chapter 14, we read these words, and I'll just leave them with you. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. I ask you again, friend, are you saved? Are you on the way to heaven? The good news is that God has provided a way for you to be in heaven. Wonderful news. A loving God. A holy God. We think of God in our Bible right at the very commencement. We read these words, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. When we think of God, we think of the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. But just the same, dear friend, I tell you this afternoon, I tell you of a God who loves you. Yes, a God who loves you. God is a loving God, and God has provided a way for you to be in heaven. heaven. You say, what is that way? Tell us about it. Well, there we read in our Bible, the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. 1 John chapter 4 is where you'll find that if you want to look it up and check of that what I am saying is true. Another verse we could have, we could have uh, read this afternoon, we quoted in your presence. John chapter 3 and verse number 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Dear friend, did you notice in those two verses that I quoted, the Father sent the world for God. You know, I come here this afternoon that no matter who is 
listening to this on their computer. And that message is that God loves you for you and that you incredible the love friend the Lord Jesus Christ that we've heard of Christ he come down from heaven into this world and you say to be the saviour of the world what did the Lord Jesus came into the world sinners to save here this afternoon because dear friend if there are the Lord Jesus Christ himself said this he said I came not to call the righteous listen but sinners to repentance one of the well known verses from our Bible John chapter 14 and says this verse number 6 the Lord Jesus is the speaker he says I am the way the truth and the life no man cometh unto the Father but by me the Lord Jesus Christ dear friend he is the way to heaven you say that's okay the Lord Jesus is the way to heaven what does he mean when he says I am the way the truth what does he mean when he says the truth dear friend this one who came from heaven the son of God he was he was perfect he was unique he was sinless the only person who ever walked this world who never had a wrong thought the only person who never committed a wrong action the only person who never said a wrong word and the, the, the writers in our Bible speaking of the Lord Jesus they say that he he knew no sin they say he did no sin and they say also in him is no sin so the Lord Jesus Christ this one who came he was sinless but dear friend he came to die for sin and God a loving God punished his son the Lord Jesus Christ for our sins for your sins you see dear friend could I put it like this if you can imagine my sins they were taken and they were laid on the Lord Jesus Christ and there on the cross at Calvary the prophet Isaiah reminds us how that the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all there on the cross at Calvary the sin of the world that was laid on the Lord Jesus Christ and what happened God punished his son for our sins you say that he finished the work absolutely he finished the work God gave him to do he bore the punishment of our sins he cried it is finished and you say well is God satisfied with that yes absolutely God is satisfied with that because we read there in Romans chapter 10 and verse 9 that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead thou shalt be saved dear friend God is satisfied he has raised his son from the dead what about you what about you my time is almost gone are you saved are you satisfied with what Christ has done at Calvary you say to me Michael quickly tell me how can I be saved well an old hymn in our hymn book it says repent believe be born again you say I know I'm a sinner I know I deserve to be punished for my sins how can I be saved think of what Jonathan told us last Sunday afternoon believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved you say oh but there has to be more to it than that what have I to do you're getting back to this trying to do something there's nothing for you to do the Lord Jesus Christ there in Matthew chapter 11 he said these words come come on to me all ye that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest how simple God's way of salvation not trying or doing one's best simply believing on Jesus 
the weary, the sinful find rest. You say, that's all very well. Can I be sure I'm saved? Can I be sure that one day I will be in heaven? Absolutely. If we think of the thieves who were crucified beside the Lord Jesus, one of them was told this by the Lord Jesus himself, having acknowledged his sin, having acknowledged his helplessness, and turning on all his need to the Lord Jesus, he said, Lord, remember me. What was he told? He was told, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Dear friend here this afternoon, I wonder will you start for heaven right now? You can do it immediately. Heaven's a wonderful place. There'll be no pain, there'll be no sorrow, there'll be no tears. There'll be no night, there'll be no death. Dear friend, heaven is a wonderful place. The dwelling place of God, my Savior is there, but one thing will never be in heaven. There will be no sin in heaven. Dear friend, will you be in heaven? You say to me, I intend to be in heaven. No, no. Will you be in heaven? If you're going to be in heaven, you need Christ. If you miss Christ, you'll miss heaven. Think of our text, and with this I finish. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given amongst men whereby we must be saved. Dear friend, are you saved? Are you on the way to heaven. The sinner who believes is free can say the Savior died for me, can point to his atoning blood and say this made my peace with God. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the opportunity we have had this afternoon of meeting at Riverside to preach the gospel and we're thankful for thy great love in ever sending the Lord Jesus into this world. We're thankful that he went to the cross and how that there upon the cross he put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. We pray that if there would be any here this afternoon who are not yet saved, we pray that they would think upon these things, make preparation for eternity, and that they would this afternoon start on the way to heaven. We ask for the blessing to be upon us as we part and go our separate ways, and we ask all returning thanks in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.